Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about several muscles that produce movements at the glenohumeral joint, which remember is the joint between the head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula. And specifically, we'll be looking at muscles here that, number one, do not belong to the rotator cuff muscle group. Those are supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. And number two, we're not going to be looking at the shoulder girdle muscles because these muscles technically produce movements of the scapula. So we'll be looking at four muscles, the deltoid, the pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, and the teres major. We'll begin by looking at the deltoid muscle. Now this over here is an anterior view of the right shoulder. So this muscle in green is of course the deltoid, but let's look at a few other pieces of important anatomy. This bone right here is the clavicle. So about right here at the very edge of the picture, this is the midline of the body where we'd have the sternum. Here's the clavicle and it extends to approximately right there where my mouse is. This muscle over here, all of this, this is all pectoralis major. Up here, this would actually be the upper part of the trapezius. That's actually one of the shoulder girdle muscles that we'll explore in one of the next videos. And this muscle right here, this two-headed muscle, uh, this is actually biceps brachii. So this one laterally is the long head of biceps, and this one medially is the short head of biceps. And then this is our deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscle has three heads, an anterior, middle, and posterior head. Posterior head we can't see in this picture. We'll have to look at this one in just a few minutes. But depending on which head of the deltoid we're talking about, it has a different origin. But notice that all three are going to have the same insertion. Now in this artist's rendition, you kind of see this dark line right here. I'm kind of tracing it right there. That's supposed to be the demarcation between the anterior deltoid and over here, which is the middle deltoid. Now in real life, if you were to look at a cadaver, there is no demarcation between the anterior and middle heads of deltoid. Okay, This is just in the artist's rendition. But over here, more anteriorly, would be the anterior head. And specifically, its origin is going to be the lateral one-third of the clavicle. You can see that right there. If this is the anterior deltoid right here, then this over here would be the middle deltoid. Now the middle deltoid has its origin on the acromial process or the acromion of the scapula. We can't see the acromion too well in this picture, so we'll look now at a posterior view of the scapula. So up here, this basin up top would be the supraspinous fossa, and then this right here is the spine of the scapula. Okay. And as we go laterally, we follow the spine. About at this point right here, it becomes continuous with this projection right here called the acromion or the acromial process. And so right here, this is the middle deltoid. And you can see that it originates off of that acromial process up to about this point right here. Now once again, we see this sort of darker line, we can trace it, that kind of demarcates between the middle and the posterior deltoid. So over here is the middle deltoid, which originates off the acromial chromium. And then on this side over here, this is the posterior deltoid. So the posterior deltoid originates from the scapular spine or the spine of the scapula. So from right here up to about this point right there. So depending on what head of the deltoid we're talking about, they all have a different origin. As a whole, however, the deltoid muscle is a convergent muscle, so it has a very broad origin, and all the fibers are going to converge down to a single tendon, which is right here. It's going to mostly penetrate through this head of the triceps brachii right here, and it's going to attach on the deltoid tuberosity, which is a small bump that lies on the lateral side of the humerus, about halfway down the length of the humerus. Okay, So the deltoid tuberosity is the insertion of the deltoid. Now, again, depending on what head we're talking about of the deltoid, they're each going to have a different action. And the differences in action really just have to do with the line of pull from the insertion to the origin. So if you think about the posterior fibers right here, they're pulling kind of in this direction, right? But the middle fibers are pulling more out like this. And so the same thing's true of the anterior fibers. And so all the heads are going to have different actions. The anterior head of the deltoid is going to produce shoulder flexion and shoulder internal rotation. And when I say shoulder here, we're specifically referring to the glenohumeral joint. Okay. And then the middle deltoid right here pulls out more laterally, and it's going to produce shoulder abduction or abduction. 
the posterior deltoid has the exact opposite action as the anterior deltoid. So the posterior head is going to produce shoulder extension and external rotation of the shoulder joint. Okay? The deltoid muscle is innervated by the axillary nerve, and there's only one other muscle that's important to know is innervated by this nerve, and that is the teres minor, one of the four rotator cuff muscles that we'll look at soon. But the deltoid is innervated by the axillary nerve. One other thing to talk about here before we go to the pectoralis major. There's this little space right here called the deltopectoral groove. It's a small space created by an opening between the most anterior part of the deltoid and the pectoralis major. Now, there are two major superficial veins that drain the upper extremity. There's the medially placed basilic vein, and then this one right here, which is laterally placed, called the cephalic vein. The cephalic vein is responsible for draining the lateral part of the upper extremity, both in the brachium and the forearm, as well as the hand. So here's the cephalic vein, and it's superficial up to about this point, but it needs to get deep where it fuses with the axillary vein. And so to do that, the cephalic vein runs up here, and it's actually going to move through this delta pectoral groove where it goes deeper and then fuses with the axillary vein to bring blood back to the heart. Okay, so that's the only other thing I wanted to mention here. Now let's talk about the pectoralis major muscle. That's these two muscles right here, the two superficial chest muscles. Now the pectoralis major, each side has three separate heads. There's a clavicular head, a sternocostal head, and an abdominal head. Sometimes the abdominal head is not talked about. It's left out and or grouped with the sternocostal head, but it's technically a separate head of this muscle. Now again, all three of these heads have a different origin. So the clavicular head is way up here, and it's going to originate on the medial half of the clavicle. So here's the clavicular head, and you know where this uh, head ends because it's where the clavicle ends. So this part only originates off of the clavicle. So all this right here, this is the clavicular head. Then we have the much larger sternocostal head. So the sternocostal head is all this, so starting right there where the clavicle ends, and going all the way down here up to about this point right here. Okay, You can imagine below this would actually be the abdominal head. So all this is the sternocostal head. Now if we look at this picture, we can actually guess some of the origins of the sternocostal head. Of course, some is on the manubrium of the sternum right here. So here's the upper part of the sternum, the manubrium. Going down below the angle of Louis right here, we have the body of the sternum. You can see much of that originating off the body of the sternum. And then deep to that, you can't see this origin, but it actually originates off of the costal cartilages of ribs one through six. So remember that coming off of the sternum, we have ribs, right? And their attachment to the sternum, most of them, is going to be costal cartilage. And so the costal cartilages, which are really kind of right in this region laterally from it, right? Uh, it has a deep origin to those costal cartilages of ribs one through six, okay? Now there's one last head to talk about, and that's the abdominal head. That's this one right here. And the abdominal head does originate partly off of costal cartilages of rib 6, 7, and 8, as you can see right here. But it also has another origin. You can't see the abdominal muscles here, but the external oblique has a broad tendon called an aponeurosis. And so that actually provides the other part of the origin of the abdominal head of pectoralis major. Now, like the deltoid muscle, uh, the pectoralis major is also a convergent muscle. You can see it obviously has a very broad origin. And then all the fibers sort of converge laterally into a single insertion. And that insertion is on the lateral lip of the bicipital groove. Now, if we zoom in here on the humerus, this is an anterior view, right? We can see this groove right here. More superiorly, or proximally, it separates the greater tubercle over here from the lesser tubercle. So this is the intertubercular groove or the bicipital groove. And the groove exists from up top here all the way down to approximately this point right there where my mouse is. Now being a groove on either side of it, it's going to have ridges, right? And those ridges are termed lips. So there's one ridge right here that's called the medial lip. And there's another ridge over here laterally called the lateral lip. The pectoralis major inserts on the lateral lip of that bicipital groove. So you find the groove, and then it inserts laterally to that. Okay. The medial lip is going to be the insertion of the other two muscles, latissimus dorsi and teres major. We'll see that in a few minutes.
Now, depending on the specific heads here, they're going to have different functions, of course. Okay, the clavicular head is pretty simple. The clavicular head mainly is going to facilitate glenohumeral flexion, okay, so shoulder flexion. The sternocostal head has a lot more functions here, and we're really grouping the abdominal head with the sternocostal head in terms of the actions. The thing about these actions is some of them can be hard to imagine uh, because we normally think of the pectoralis major as being a lateral flexion or a horizontal adduction muscle. That's the motion that you would use when you're doing a bench press or pec flies in the gym. That's usually the action that we think of. But depending on the starting position of the shoulder joint, it can also facilitate shoulder adduction and extension of the shoulder. Let's talk about how that can happen. Let's suppose you start out with your arms abducted. So your arms are out like this, right? If you start in that position, the sternocostal head can help bring the humerus back down to this position uh, next to the body. That would be shoulder adduction. But in order to do that, you have to begin in an abducted position. Okay, so if you start out like this, okay, this is not going to facilitate really any more adduction. Okay, you have to start out in an abducted position. In the same way, the sternocostal head here can facilitate shoulder extension, but not from this position right here. So if you start in a flexed position, so if you bring your arm out in front of you to 90 degrees in the sagittal plane, and then move it back to right by your side, it will facilitate extension about up to that point. Okay, but bringing the arm any further behind you into extension or hyperextension is going to require the other two muscles that we're about to talk about, so latissimus dorsi and teres major. So again, these two, shoulder adduction and extension, really depend on the start position for pectoralis major. The other thing that the sternocostal head does is internal rotation of the shoulder joint. So in that respect, it's going to be synergistic with the subscapularis of the rotator cuff group. Okay. And then the pectoralis major is innervated by two nerves, the medial pectoral nerve and the lateral pectoral nerve, which come from the medial cord and the lateral cord of the brachial plexus, respectively. As we just mentioned, the clavicular head of pectoralis major and the anterior deltoid both facilitate shoulder flexion. So an example of an exercise that would actually give you shoulder flexion would be to take really any object. It could be a barbell or dumbbells or any object like that and basically just go like this. This movement right here is shoulder flexion. Okay, you don't need to go up this high, although that's still flexion, but basically going from this position up to here, that is flexion. If I wanted to work shoulder abduction or abduction, I would simply take the object, whatever it is, and move it in the frontal plane like this. So going from by the side right here to this position is shoulder abduction. The major agonist of abduction of the shoulder is the middle deltoid, although we do get some assistance by the supraspinatus, one of the four rotator cuff muscles. Now, shoulder adduction or adduction is facilitated by several muscles. The movement looks like this, going from the outer position like that back toward the side. So starting here and moving back is adduction or adduction. And there are several muscles that will assist that movement, assuming that it's resisted. If it's not resisted, it won't be. But if it's resisted, it would be latissimus dorsi, it would be teres major, it would also be sternocostal head of pectoralis major, assuming you're starting out in this position and moving back. Sternocostal head of pectoralis major can also assist with that movement. And then another muscle that we'll talk about in another video is coracobrachialis. Coracobrachialis can also facilitate shoulder adduction, assuming that it's resistant. All right, now let's talk about the latissimus dorsi. So this is a muscle that you find on the back of a person. Now, it's not a true back muscle because it doesn't produce any movements of the back. When we talk about true back muscles, we're thinking more of a rector spiny. So those are producing movements of the spine, like extension, right? This muscle sits on the back, but it doesn't produce any back movements. It produces movements of the shoulder joint by virtue that it attaches on the humerus. Now, you can see this muscle is pretty dang large, has a very large origin, and the origin is medial. So the origins of the latissimus dorsi on each side are going to be the spinous processes of T7 all the way down through L5, way down here. And then also, 
this thickening of the tendon of Latismus dorsi is really an aponeurosis, especially more inferiorly, and that aponeurosis really becomes continuous with the fascia, the deep fascia in this region, and so we consider the origin the thoracolumbar fascia, or TFL. Also, you can see that the thoracolumbar fascia has attachments on the iliac crest, also the sacrum, which I don't have uh, listed here, and then the inferior four ribs, which are going to be ribs 9, 10, 11, and 12. And again, you can't see that because that's deep to this. Okay, But very broad origin here. Again, latissimus dorsi is another convergent muscle. So all the fibers are going to run up like this to a common insertion point. And the insertion is the medial lip of the bicipital groove. Now, we just talked about that in the context of pectoralis major. So here's our bicipital groove. And then this is the lateral lip right here. That's the insertion of pectoralis major. The medial lip is over here. And so the medial lip is going to be the insertion of both latissimus dorsi and teres major. Again, can't see it too well in here because it kind of wraps around the humerus anteriorly to reach it. But it does insert on that medial lip of the bicipital groove. Now the actions of latissimus dorsi are pretty straightforward. They're going to be shoulder adduction, extension, and internal rotation. So the adduction and extension, that's going to be the major function of latissimus dorsi and teres major. They're adductors and extensors. And so when you do lat pull downs or rows, you are heavily utilizing latissimus dorsi among other muscles because they are the major shoulder extensors. The internal rotation here is produced because this muscle really more or less inserts on the anterior part of the humerus. If the muscle inserted more on the posterior part, it would produce more external rotation. Okay? So this is inserting on the anterior part on the medial lip, and so it's producing more internal rotation. And then the latissimus dorsi is innervated by the thoracodorsal nerve. This is the only major muscle that we're going to look at that is innervated by the thoracodorsal nerve. Just useful to know that. And then the last muscle to cover, this is a really small one called teres major. The teres major, I want to be very clear, is not a rotator cuff muscle. There is a similar muscle nearby called teres minor, but teres major is not a rotator cuff muscle because in order to be a rotator cuff muscle, you have to have your origin on the scapula, which this does, but the insertion would need to be on the greater or lesser tubercle. Okay, here's the greater tubercle right here. The lesser one's more anterior. This one doesn't insert there. And so because it fails that uh, qualification, it's not a rotator cuff muscle. So you can see here that teres major originates on the inferior angle of the scapula right here. And then it projects up here, and it's going to insert also on the medial lip of the bicipital groove. Again, we're looking at a posterior view here of the scapula. We can tell that because we can see the spine. If we couldn't see the spine, we would know it's an anterior view. So being that the medial lip is more anterior, we can't actually really see that, but it suffices to say that it would insert right there, kind of underneath pectoralis major, as we talked about with latissimus dorsi. So medial lip of the bicipital groove. And because it really has the same insertion and more or less the same line of pull as latissimus dorsi, it has the same actions. So like latissimus dorsi, the teres major facilitates shoulder adduction shoulder extension, and shoulder internal rotation. Now, being that the teres major is much smaller than the latissimus dorsi, uh, you can imagine this muscle is not going to be the major agonist. It's going to assist latissimus dorsi, but it's nowhere near as strong or as powerful as that muscle. Okay, But it does contribute. And the innervation of the teres major is the lower subscapular nerve. If I want to work shoulder extension, it really depends on where my shoulder starts out at as to what muscles are worked more. So for example, the entire range of motion of extension really would just start in a maximally flexed position like this. Okay? And then as I go through this range of motion, this is extension, and it really continues until I literally can't get any more range of motion posteriorly. Okay? This would be my maximally extended position. Now, in some sources, you may see from here just back to this neutral position as extension, and anything past this would be hyperextension. Okay? We're going to make that distinction here. Now, from the fully flexed position right here, all the way to about neutral where the arm's by my side, all of those muscles contribute. 
latissimus dorsi, teres major, posterior deltoid, and the sternocostal head of pectoralis major. So past this point, pectoralis major's sternocostal head will no longer contribute because it's not in a position where it can actually pull posterior. And that's because pectoralis major's origin and insertion are anterior. So once this gets to neutral, there's really no way that the pectoralis major can pull this backwards. So from there, we're relying on posterior musculature to get the remaining range of motion into hyperextension. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the major anatomy and the origin, insertion, action, and innervation of the four major muscles that produce movements at the shoulder joint. In the next video, we'll look at the shoulder girdle muscles, after that the rotator cuff muscles, and then we'll move into the brachium where we'll start talking about the anterior and posterior compartments of the brachium. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel.